In March, I went across to the vineyard in Illinois, sorry, in Urbana, Champagne, um, and um, I was out there, I was teaching at a More Love, More Power conference, and, um, but I ended up having an encounter that I'll describe a bit later, but it was so powerful, I was energized for months, and um, I went through a season when I just was just overcome and overwhelmed, and forgive me if I let out a hoot, because it's one of those inconvenient manifestations that happens in restaurants and all sorts of places, but that's, that's what's been going on. And so I've made a total fool of myself on many occasions, and, um, but I've also had some quite wonderful encounters with people, unbelievers, but also some strange spiritual encounters and dreams. And uh, I don't normally dream. Uh, I'm not someone that dreams. I'm quite, I'm okay at interpreting dreams, but I don't have dreams myself, but I've been having lots of dreams. And, um, and then I was driving along uh, shortly after I'd come back, and I, I felt the Lord just say the words, now is the time, now is the time. And, um, and uh, so I, I went to the, the leadership group and I, I said, you know, I, just, I, th I think maybe we should call the conference now is the time. And the Lord had spoken to Andy Smith and, and we kind of agreed that that would be a good name, but I didn't really quite know why, what the Lord was saying. But it's, it's a, a word that comes from Paul speaking to the, second, to, the, to the Corinthian church and we find this word in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, where it where Paul is quoting Isaiah, and he says, In the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And so Paul is quoting Isaiah. And I'm just going to be referring to this from time to time, trying to explain what I think the Lord is saying to us. But what Paul is doing is he's actually misquoting Isaiah. Because... Um, what, what Isaiah actually says is, in the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the time of my salvation, I will help you. And so Isaiah is declaring something that is to come for the people of Israel, but Paul is saying, God heard you. God has helped you. In other words, it's happened. You know, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the restoration of Israel. And so Paul is saying to the early church, you know, what was being cried out for, what was being prophesied has happened. And so I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So he's reminding them of what God did, of what God does, and what is happening for them right now. And so it's all been done. You know, Jesus has done it. He's the answer, but he's also our future. But I am convinced that this is a time to go back to this word and see how it applies to today and what the Lord wants to do. So I'm going to attempt to explain some of this, and I'm going to talk about now being the time to become aware, now being the time to prepare, and now being the time to be confident. And so bear with me, we're going to sort of go down the valley a little bit, and then we're going to come up the other side. So I want to start with now being the time to become aware. Now, right now, like many vineyards across this nation, we may be enjoying a degree of favor um, uh, from our towns, our villages, our cities, and uh, we've worked hard. We've hurt, worked hard to change the perception that people have of Christians. I remember as a teenager walking through the streets of Nottingham and literally seeing a man with a bored, you know, hell and damnation. I mean, that's what they were shouting out in the streets. Uh, members of churches would be out on the streets sort of rattling, um, uh, asking the world for money to help with church business. Um, I was somebody who had lots of non-Christian friends and I would take them to church and it was embarrassing how they were not be expected in churches. You know, people were not expecting people who didn't believe to come into the church and it seemed embarrassing and irrelevant at the time. And also, Christians were really judgmental judgmental about people who came from chaotic uh, backgrounds or addicts, AIDS victims, gay people. I mean, only a few churches um, seemed to have a heart of compassion. Only a few churches were doing practical things uh, for those in need. And there was no such thing as acts of kindness or servant evangelism. And it was incredibly rare to find a Christian who believed that they could lay hands on the sick and that sick person would get healed, let alone go out on the streets to the pubs and places and actually pray for unbelievers. And then John Wimber came to the UK 
with teams of young people in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they encourage churches across denominations, across our nation, to move out their comfort zones and extend God's kingdom. And so with his visits came a renewed sense of vision. And we experienced worship and the presence of God. We encountered God. We became supernatural. We started healing and prophesying over one another and outside on the streets. And people started to get delivered. And we came to expect to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again. And we began to reach out to the poor and engage in power evangelism. And to love one another and across denominations. And to bless our communities with kindness and generosity and to once again be confident in the gospel. And so for years, it, we've labored, we've worked really hard in the vineyard, along with churches everywhere, to do those things. And I could tell you stories, more stories like the one we've just seen, of many of you and churches and lives changed. And we have made huge progress. Only you know, a couple of weekends, or just last weekend, when the bomb went off in Ireland, in Londonderry, not surprising, the instinct of the Derry Vineyard, the vineyard there, was to reach out. They couldn't meet in their own building because uh, it was all, you know, they weren't allowed to go near it um, because it was right there where the bomb, kind of close to where the bomb went off. But they went out on the streets and they worshipped and they prayed and they led someone to Jesus and they healed somebody. And so this is what we do. This is instinctive to us. And I can honestly say here at Trent, we are friends with our city. Uh, when we built our kids' centre, we had the privilege of going to the council and saying to them, what is it that you can't do with all the cutbacks? What is it that you would want to do for children in our city that you can't do right now? And they kind of looked confused and wondered whether it was that we wanted to know what they couldn't do so we could do it. But we said, no, we want to give you money. And we ended up giving them £100,000. And they were, you can imagine the tears in their eyes. They were so moved. However, culture is changing. There is a shift going on, and it is becoming increasingly challenging to be a Christian. The tide is turning, and we need to be aware. Because as fast as we're attempting to reach people, to change their perceptions, to change their lives, to seek to impact our cities, this warm reception we may be experiencing is beginning to shift. And Jesus warned us of this, didn't he? He and other New Testament writers, they warned us to be aware. In Matthew, it, it, quoting Jesus, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. We need to be aware of the reality and we need to prepare because the foundations of Christendom on which Western culture was built are crumbling. Charles Murray is an American sociologist, and he was commenting on Europe, and he said something along these lines. You are experimenting in Europe. You have done away with God. You have done away with everything that holds society together and have nothing to replace it with. It is a terrible experiment. There is a growing ideology telling us that there is no absolute truth. So people are confused and muddled, scrambling around for something on which to build values. And when people don't know where to look and what to build their lives and their values on, then not surprisingly, they go inside. And so selfishness and narcissism is rising. It's all about the self, sovereignty of self, the reign of self. And with this belief, comes this idea that we can construct our own identity and our own moral good. It's an ideology that affects every aspect of our identity, and it, it looks like we're sort of able to tailor and construct whatever we prefer, whatever our preferences are uh, around our sexuality or our gender, even our biological age. Uh, uh, all these things are being challenged. Consequently, anybody outside of ourselves is deemed responsible for hurting us and offending us if they don't validate my own personal sense of reality. However absurd, however untrue it may be, uh, if somebody believes what they believe about themselves coming from the inside, if it's not validated, then they are becoming offended and even saying, I feel abused. Now, you may have seen news stories um, of a Dutch man recently who wanted to change his age and have kind of the legal certificate to say that he was born so that he's half the age that he is. Or you may have heard of examples of, of people um, who identify uh, of, uh, of an ethnicity outside of their own biological heritage. 
Uh, you may have experienced some of these things at a local level. Some of the things that are going on, like one couple came to us and um, they told us about their grandchild who was asked by a very well-meaning teacher, somebody who wants to look out for the minority. And she drew a line uh, on the board and she said, where are you on the spectrum between boy and girl? To a class of children who don't need that burden. And it's well-intentioned. And I want to be very clear that as Christians, we believe that every individual is made in the image of God. Everybody needs to be treated with dignity. And those who are confused and, and who suffer from various disorders, we need to be incredibly compassionate. And we believe in the rights of individuals. But there is a drive towards a political correctness that is challenging the rights of individuals to hold views or to disagree with what is deemed to be politically correct. And all kinds of laws are coming to pass very quickly before people have had the opportunity to just appropriately debate and discuss what the consequences of some of those laws are. In a magazine article by Coalition for Marriage, they referred to the Ashes Bake a case that we've all heard of, and uh, they said about how it shows how equality is being used to silence anyone who disagrees with devastating consequences for free speech. So we just need to be aware that this has implications on us as followers of Jesus. Sharing our faith, even offering to pray for somebody, could be experienced by somebody as a microaggression. There's a young vicar called Reverend Peter Sanyan, and he's here in the UK, and he wrote an article, and he said this, people recall when many thought Christians were ignorant due to their unscientific beliefs. Today, people in their 20s think Christians are not ignorant, but evil and dangerous due to their inability to commend radical sexual ideologies, Islam, and further government controls of life details. People who are evil, they say, must be silenced, protected from themselves, and prevented from infecting others with their beliefs. Now, we may not agree with everything that he says, but we do need to recognize that something is changing. Steve Nicholson, I saw recently on an Insights piece, we may have a recording of something similar, but this was aimed at young leaders in the New Wine Networks, and he said this, God is sending the church into exile to save us from consumerism, selfishness, and narcissism. And you guys, you are going to have to learn how to live and do the work of the kingdom in the midst of a hostile situation. And that is the will of God. So folks, now is the time to prepare. And I'm talking about these things not to frighten us, to scare us, but to challenge us and to encourage us to face some of them, the, the realities that are coming towards us. Steve goes on to say this about exile and hostility. He says, and what you might not understand is that that is a privilege, not a burden, because the greatest days have always been when the church is in exile, and the worst days have always been when the church is in bed with culture and government. He says, don't look at us, don't look at the people before us, but go before Constantine. Look at the age of the martyrs, or even present-day martyrs. I would add, go to the scriptures. Look at Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Nehemiah, Esther, people who lived in exile. But mostly, look at Jesus and the early church. Look at Jesus, who was shunned by the cultural leaders of his day. And as he explained... In John chapter 15, verse 20, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So we can follow in the pattern of Jesus' living, a holy life imbued with vision and purpose. Even while living in a religiously foreign culture, he was truly living in exile from his heavenly home. And so we need to look afresh at the early church. Look how they prayed. Do you know, if you feel sometimes lament and fear rising, even despairing, Take that pit in your stomach and pray, and pray. If you feel fear rising, it's God stirring. If you feel lament, if you feel trepidation, just take it to the Lord in prayer. We need to prepare emotionally. We need to prepare spiritually. We need to engage in some honest reflection and self-examination. 
We need to consider what the cultural ideologies are that have crept into the church and into our own hearts. What are the lies that we have bought into, the idols that we subconsciously pay homage to? Is it reputation? Is it favor with our city? Is it a degree of success? Is it, is it financial security? Is it power? Is it, is it a, a sort of sense of like a career progressing somewhere? Is it marriage and children and family and what that means today? Is it even doing good, you know, being do-gooders? In the end, these things are not ultimately what it's all about and they're not ultimately the things that satisfy us deeply. Anybody with life experience will tell you that we have been made for something deeper, something greater, something extraterrestrial, something utterly supernatural, something totally heavenly. We've been made to connect with God's love that never dies, a union with God who is so sovereign, supernatural, so beautiful, so intensely pleasurable. We have been made for a future with no tears and no pain but we have to root ourselves in that future. We have to know who we are. We have to believe so that we can live through some of the challenges that are coming. There is no doubt about it that our future is secure and clear. Our future is secure regardless of present day realities. Now, if I'm completely honest, I, I do sometimes get fearful and I look at what it is that I'm actually attached to what it is that causes me to be fearful, and I've had to do some really serious reflection on this. And, and you know, the question of how do we prepare, because there are so many unknowns. But I tell you the truth here, what, who I do have complete trust in is God. Total and utter confidence in Him. And so I want to say to us all, now is the time to be confident. As Christians, we have the most amazing message to this generation. This question of identity that keeps coming up, this confusion where people are desperately seeking for answers, they are all answered in Jesus. There's that beautiful song that, that we sing from time to time from Hillsong, where it says, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen. You are for me. I am who you, you, God, say I am. This is such an incredible answer to a generation, this, the millennial generation that is so confused about who they are. We don't need to navigate and decide our own identities. You know, we don't need to navigate this in this cultural swirl of confusion because God says, I am who God says I am. He tells us who we are. Our identity is given to us. It's received. He's the ultimate validator of who we are. And we can be totally confident in him. So with all the cultural shifts, with all the uncertainty, there is a desperation building in this culture. And so I have an expectation that God is going to do something. So I want to instill in you a sense of confidence, a sense of expectancy and hope. I want to exhort you to take confidence that now is the time of God's favor, that now is the day of salvation. I woke up one morning in May and I was absolutely devastated. I was sobbing and sobbing and I, I, in, I had a vivid dream and in the dream I, I I was holding this baby, and this baby was not alive. I had given birth to a baby, but the baby was still born, and I was utterly devastated. I was so stirred, and I didn't understand. What is it, Lord? I can't have a baby. I'm not fertile anymore. Something miraculous has happened, but what is this? I, I've given birth to a stillborn child. I was absolutely grief-stricken, and I asked the Lord, what does it mean? What does it mean? And uh, over the days, I was just, Lord, what does this mean? And then in a random conversation, I was talking to my, a very good friend of mine, and I found myself saying the words, I'm expectant, I'm expectant. And, uh, and I felt the Lord say to me, nurture expectancy, nurture expectancy, because if I had known I was pregnant, if I was known I was carrying something miraculous that only God can do, if I was known, if I knew I was carrying something that was so sovereign, what would I do? What would I do differently? Well, I would, have, I would have been so thankful. I would have been praying. I would have taken care of myself. I would have talked about it. I would have prepared myself mentally and emotionally. I would have made room in the house. I would have celebrated this extraordinary miracle. And I would have really taken care of myself. And I looked at the two older women in the scriptures, two barren women, Sarah and Elizabeth, two women who would have been ashamed and despairing because in their culture it was so dishonorable to not be able to conceive a child. 
They would have had times where they lost hope, where it looked like there was nothing happening, nothing happening. And then they reach that age of the menopause and, it, and it's gone. And they're just, there's nothing going to happen. And then out of that desperation comes a miracle of birth. And something that God did involved these two in giving birth to Isaac and John the Baptist, some great, amazing people who uh, opened up doors for something miraculous. I believe God wants to birth something in us and through us, not just the vineyard, through the church in this nation, in this time. Now, last year, you'll remember Pastor Agu, and he spoke to us, and he kept saying, don't tell me I haven't seen the cloud. Don't tell me I haven't seen the cloud. And he had this sense of expectancy that was birthed not only from his extraordinary life of prayer, but it's the, the sense of increase of prayer across the nation. And you know, since we decided as a leadership group that we would call the conference, now is the time, I have heard this phrase over and over again. And I was listening to John Tyson talking about leaders preparing for now, preparing for this time. And he talked about the time for leaders to become soldiers, not civilians. That means we need to be alert, we need to be trained, we need to be ready for warfare, we need to be ready for mission. And you know, we do warfare in the vineyard by, you know, one to one, that means leading people to Jesus, but we also recognize we're in a spiritual battle and we pray and we ask God to intervene on our behalf, to post angels, to, you know, we just give ourselves to prayer. Now is the time for leaders to be athletes, not spectators. You know, we need to practice what we preach. We need to do things in the secret place so then when we come out in the open, in the visible place, we we are actually authentic to what we've been doing in the private place. That means we need to be intentional. We need to be careful. We need to be practiced. We need to get in the game and and ourselves be uh, leading people to Jesus or at least sharing the good news, praying for the sick and casting out demons and feeding the poor. You know, now is the time for leaders to be farmers, not consumers. That means sowing seeds and waiting when it comes to developing leaders, to nurturing successors, to nurturing church planters, to releasing people. It takes time to invest and cultivate and uh, release and let people take uh, you know, experience and, and take risks for themselves. Seeds take time to grow. It's a process. So we need to be patient like farmers. And then I heard Danielle Strickland She posted something on social media, I ended up listening to one of her podcasts, and she kept repeating the phrase, the time is now, the time is now. And she was speaking at what she was seeing going on in Europe. And she was saying all over Europe, there are things stirring, and people are moved and stirred to pray and fast, and there are people who are calling out to God, and they're beginning to see just changes and and shifts. And then I went to HTB, to the big conference that they host for leaders, and the opening talk um, uh, that, that Nicky Gumbel opened the, the, the conference with was now is the time of God's favor. And he went on to speak from Psalm 133 and he talked about the favor of God flowing out of unity. And oh my goodness, I thought something is going on in this nation. And as we speak to other church leaders and other movement leaders, they say the prophets are stirring. Something is stirring. People are desperate. And folks, when things are uncertain, Now, when people like Steve Nicholson talk about going into exile, prophets in our church tell us that we're going into the dark ages, something that looks like that. I believe God is pointing us to this same assurance where Paul speaks to the early church. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. This is why I'm confident. This is why I'm hopeful. This is why I'm nurturing expectancy. When I was out in... um, uh, uh, the vineyard in Urbana, the Champagne Vineyard. I, I was there, um, I'd spoken, I was there at their after party, and I was quietly minding my own business, having some snacks in the corner. And I heard somebody say, Chad, I hear your seminar was really powerful. And as is my way, if I hear anybody is doing anything where the Holy Spirit's on the move, I kind of have a habit of just, that's it, I'm going, going for them. I turned around, I looked this man in the eye, a middle-aged man, I said, you're coming to England. And he came towards me, he goes, yes, I am. And I, I said, well, what, what do you mean? You know, he goes, yes, I, the Lord told me that, and I, I haven't been looking for a connection, but I didn't know why I was here, but I now realize I'm supposed to talk to you. And he began to prophesy first over my two sons. And of course, that really got to me because it was packed with revelation. There were things that he knew that he could not have known about my boys. And of course, that totally gripped 
my attention. And then he began to talk about things that God has for England and for the vineyard and for John and myself, and it was all a bit too much. I went to bed that night, and I was shaken. I couldn't sleep. I talked to John, and, and you know, I just couldn't sleep. And the next morning, I went into a session a couple of hours before I was due to fly back, and Patty, who's here this week speaking on identity, um, was speaking, and he was talking along the lines of, you know, when you come into agreement with God about what you carry and your calling, and, and he talked about some of the blockages to that and, and ways, you know, we need to sort of, you know, when we first come to faith, we need to kind of get healed up and delivered, and, and then we start to come into the realization of who we are, and then we come into promises, and then we begin to accept our calling. Then what is it that we need to do to, to move in the calling? And there is an agreement we have to come to, and at that point, the Holy Spirit landed on me, and I jumped out of my seat, and I landed in the passageway, and the whole meeting was just dropped, and we had to stop the meeting early because I made such a din as, you know... And, um, and it went on for, for ages, and I just had some amazing prophetic encounters with strangers and all sorts of things. And, um, but but if, I, I can't tell you everything that Chad said, but, but he, he, we then did bring him over, and he prophesied over our, our team and, and our local church, and it, we had an amazing time. But he, he talked about um, coming into agreement with, with what we carry, who we are, and I believe that's a word for us every one of you. It does, whatever size of ministry, do not, do not look at what you're doing as if you're barren. There are amazing seeds that you're sowing. Do not look at the size of the church or the, what the work looks like. Do not, do not question what God is doing. Know what you carry. Be confident in who you are and what the Lord has entrusted you with. Be confident because it's, what the, Lord, it's the Lord in you. It's not even us. And he talked about the vineyard being ripped wide open in a positive way, incredibly positive. He talked about the Holy Spirit being wide open to a move of God. And he said, the Father is targeting England. Uh, and what he said, he's targeting England, then it's going to ricochet over to the US. And he said, you know, we need to embrace the calling, embrace the calling that God has given, given us, and then we need, to, we need to step into it. And so, folks, it's really important to know who we are if we're going to participate with God in the times ahead. We were talking with Derek Morphew when he came over uh, later on in May, and, and he explained to us how he felt that there was something that maybe had been missing in the vineyard about identity, understanding who we are. And uh, so he himself has written a module that uh, we will all you know, but get to, to, to watch and understand at some point, but, uh, but this week, Patti will explain some things about identity that are really important. So now is the time to be confident in who we are, confident in the fullness of Christ that, has, that we have been brought into. I've always felt that we are so well placed in the vineyard for a harvest of souls. You know, we just, we love the presence of God. I mean, we just love the presence of God. God is so intimate with us and we love his word and we are supernatural and we are compassionate and we are relevant and we're relational, and we're real, and we are very flexible in our models, and we will have to open our eyes and ears to imagination for new models uh, for the times that are coming. But I don't say this to brag, because I'm only bragging about Jesus. It's Jesus in us. It's not us. It's all him. But it's time to be confident in what we've been entrusted with. Don Williams, um, wonderful theologian in the vineyard, in 2011, he wrote this about the vineyard. He said, God has given the vineyard a sacred trust a solid biblical theology of the kingdom, living in the eschatological tension, reliance on the power of the gifts of the spirit for ministry in the context of church planting and building for mission and the call to warfare against all the powers of darkness. To downplay these gifts is to be disobedient and faithless. Yes, we're aware of the warfare that's coming, but we're poised, we're getting ready. Our fight is on the ground. It's ministry, it's church planting, it's mission, and to share the blessing wider. In November 2017, a couple of months before last year's National Leaders Conference, John Scott called John and myself, and he gave us a word. He said, the enemy wants to rob you of vision, but God says we need to dream big. Less than two months later, we were sitting uh, having dinner, Mike Pilavacci was in the room, and I caught him having an illicit conversation <laughs> with our DTI, Dreaming the Impossible, young leaders gathered there. It was, it was a wonderful conversation because he did apologize. that He had he'd gone ahead of himself, and he, he sat down with us, and he said, the Lord's told me that I need to lay down Soul Survivor. And, you know, it's a huge ministry, and it leaves a huge gap. 
And we prayed and we sought the Lord and uh, we, we felt, and he said, you carry the DNA. We are, we've been birthed out of the same move that, that came across with the vineyard. He said, soul survivor has the DNA of the vineyard. Please take, please open the doors to your um, Dreaming the Impossible conference. You, you, your leaders have got what it takes. Please open the doors. And so we went to the, the leadership group, and, and the moment we talked, the Holy Spirit fell on us. We, we just, we knew that there is a harvest of souls. We cannot match, I don't believe at this point, the 28,000 gap. There will be other youth um, things that start, but, but we, have moved, we are moving DTI to the summer. We are moving it to a new um, uh, place, the place that Souls of Our has been, where they, we, can, we can go from... 1,200 to 5,000. I mean, we don't know if they're all going to come, but we are preparing ourselves because God has spoken. It's one of those opportunities in this lifetime. It is one of those opportunities to bring in a harvest of souls. Now is the time for us to unite around this dream and this vision, to reach out to young people beyond our own movement, uh, to reach out with what God has entrusted us with to save souls for this nation, a generation to change the nation's This is how we do warfare. It's often the case that when there are shifts in culture like we are seeing, with all the uncertainties, whatever this dreadful stuff going on with Brexit, you know, what a time of uncertainty, with terrorist threats, with upheavals in culture and and the effects of climate change and on and on, you know, abortion laws and things that are so utterly disturbing and wretched and difficult and challenging. It is at times like this when history indicates that the Spirit of God intensifies. It's time like this when people become open. This is the time that is ripe for revival. I didn't know they were going to do that piece. I didn't know, and they didn't know. I don't think they knew that I was going to come to the end and talk about what I feel the Lord is stirring us. It's a time to cry out for revival. I'm not talking about, although I don't mind if we have exciting meetings, I'm talking about converts. That's what I'm praying for. Let me just give you an example of a revival that happened in Ulster in the 1850s. I'm going to tell you the end before I tell you the beginning, but in the end, it saw over 100,000 people swept in the presence of God. And what would happen is, is it was such a sovereign move of God that as the ships approached the shores of Ireland, people would fall to the floor, convicted under the power of the Holy Spirit. And it caused such a disturbance that the shipping um, companies had to hire chaplains. So they would be on the ships to handle this chaos and explain to people what was happening with them and how they could come to Christ. But now I'll go back to how it started. A certain Mrs. Colville in England, in Gateshead, comes into an inheritance. She prays, and she feels the Lord say, go across to Ireland and start a door-knocking ministry. She goes across to Ireland and, uh, and gathers women and a few other people, and they start knocking on doors. Two years go by, and after a great deal of disappointment, she decides to come home. What she didn't know is about the third door before the end of her trip, she knocks on the door of a certain Miss Brown. Miss Brown opens the door, and Mrs. Colville or one of the women explain the gospel. And um, it doesn't, doesn't sound like Mrs. Brown came to faith, but in the room adjacent, there is a young man, a violent, drunk uh, young man who hears the gospel, and he becomes convicted, and he goes to see his local ministry. and says, what must I do? And the minister leads him to the Lord, and then says, you must, lead your, you must tell your friends what's happened to you, and you must pray. Six months later, the Ulster revival is in full swing. Folks, do not despise the day of small beginning. Don't you dare despise those of you who are struggling right now who just may have 30 people or 10 people in your church. Do not despair and do not despise the day of small beginnings because God is on the move. And I'm asking God, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, do it. Do it in the UK. I don't care where it is. I don't care if it isn't even in the vineyard. If it, even if it doesn't begin there, I'm going to go and catch the fire. Whatever you want to do. I want to see people convicted. We want to see extraordinary prayer release, something of a move of the Spirit. I want to cry out for something that is a Spirit-initiated move of God, where the result is conversions, where sleepy, nominal Christians uh, wake up and start playing their part, where people who are hard to reach, where people who are difficult against the church, where they just sovereignly become converted and we're ready to catch them and to bring them to Jesus where we're mobilized with confidence in who we are and the gospel that we carry. Let me tell you a story that John Bodley, one of our associate pastors, was telling us. It's a young man he's discipling at the moment and this young man is a magician 
And he uh, is just hasn't got a background in church, but he came to faith, and uh, he's been coming to the church, and he hears one Sunday my husband, John, teaching on giving, giving your money uh, to the church and practicing generosity. And he, he really doesn't quite like this message. And he goes home, and he's wrestling with it, but he, he's come into an inheritance, and he prays. And as he prays, the Lord convicts him and reminds him of something he did when he was young. A bunch of friends vandalized a church in this country. They wrecked it. And he is repentant. And he feels the Lord say, you need to call up and send your money uh, to this church. And so he calls the vicar there, who's not the same man who was there when he went and vandalized. But he says, this is what I did and, uh, and I, uh, you know, I did this terrible thing and vandalized your church, and I want to give you the money. And so the, chi- the vicar was delighted and gave him the, the, the bank details, but then the money didn't go through. And so he, he called again, he said, it's not going through. And the vicar then said to him, I tell you what, why don't you come and visit us on Sunday? Tell the church what's happened to you. So he turns up to this little church, and he tells them how he's come under conviction, how he's come to faith, and what the Lord told him. And he told them how he and a bunch of friends destroyed their church, vandalized it. And of course, there were people in the congregation who remembered that Sunday. One young guy remembered how he turned up, he was one of the kids, turns up for Sunday school and said they have to sort out the church and the mess. And the whole morning is taken up with people trying to tidy the wreckage up and sort things out. And then he remembered, this young boy remembers how the vicar back then told them they had to pray for the vandals that they would come to faith in Jesus. <laughs> Folks, that's a glimpse of repentance. There's a renowned atheist. He said, religion is over in Europe, and Europeans need to come to terms with it. Yep, maybe religion is over, but Jesus isn't. And we carry Jesus wherever we go. The gospel works, it's tried, it's tested through challenge and persecution. I don't know how exile is gonna play out, but I do know that we need to have confidence and we can have confidence. We need to be ready with the answers. The vineyard began with a woman on her knees, depressed, crying out, repentant because she had thwarted her husband's journey with Jesus into the gifts of the Spirit. Her name was Carol Wimber. That repentance became the outpouring of the Spirit. It turned into a blessing for the whole church. It has crossed through the the nations. That blessing became mission. So as we head into 2019, I believe that now is the time to be aware. Now is the time to prepare. Now is the time to be confident. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation.